So welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining Brain Teachers' first virtual panel of the year, Psychedelics and Primary Care. We are honored to have four brilliant guests for today's panel, and I know we are all going to learn a lot from this conversation. For those of you who aren't yet familiar with our work, Brain Futures is a national nonprofit based in Maryland that advances equitable access to brain-based interventions that work. We know that the research on mental health and brain fitness is years ahead of the options that are widely available to patients. Brain Futures translates science to advance human potential and helps bridge that gap. Since 2021, we've been working to build the field of psychedelic-assisted therapy. Our focus is specifically on the future prescription use of psychedelics, although it is important for primary care providers to also be aware that states like Oregon and Colorado are legalizing access to facilitated, facilitated psychedelic experiences outside of clinical contexts. In 2022, Brain Futures published three major reports on psychedelic-assisted therapy, one documenting the cl clinical evidence for seven different psychedelic compounds, one outlining the path from research to clinical adoption, and a third that dives deep into the psychotherapeutic aspects of psychedelic-assisted therapy. You can follow our work on LinkedIn and Twitter. We will have time for questions at the end of the session, so please use the Q&A feature to submit your questions. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Darren Smith. Dr. Smith is a physician assistant. He sits on the board of directors of the American Psychedelic Practitioners, Practitioners Association. He also serves as a director of education for the Alma Institute, an Oregon-based psilocybin training facility, and is on Chakruna's Racial Equity and Access Committee. Dr. Smith, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Welcome, welcome again, everyone. This is exciting diving into psychedelics that's an important for the field of medicine as we look down the road towards um, rescheduling MDMA and psilocybin, hopefully in 2024. Uh, this action by the Federal Drug Administration could likely mean that patients will um, ask you questions about these substances. Um, primary care is the gatekeeper of mental health, and is, it, is, it is my hope that after this discussion, providers will uh, be inspired to explore this treatment modality uh, and think about how they may incorporate this uh, patch therapy into uh, practice, into your practice. So patch therapy, I'm going to have uh, one of our guests explain what that is here in just a second. But um, with that being said, let me introduce our wonderful panelists. First on deck is uh, Dr. Erica Baden. Uh, she, uh, she is a primary care physician uh, and is board certified uh, uh, in family medicine. She, in her practice, she emphasizes behavioral health, patient access, and inclusion. Dr. Baden trained at the University of Utah. Go Utes! <laughs> she has been a featured guest on podcasts and panel discussions on the use of psychedelics, especially in primary care and in the BIPOC community. Dr. Baden is also a director and member of Black Physicians in Utah. Welcome, Dr. Baden. Next on deck is Andrew Penn, who is a psychiatric nurse practitioner and professor at UC San Francisco. He's also a psychedelic psychotherapist researcher and international invited speaker. Uh, Mr. Penn, uh, I'll call him Andrew. Uh, Andrew has published his works in academic journals and you can reach him at andrewpennnp.com. And I think we'll put that in the chat box if I'm not sure. I think we have a way of getting, getting that information to you. Uh, next on deck is, is a person who really doesn't need any introduction, but for this particular community, maybe maybe so, but uh, all of us in, in the psych world know her very well. Uh, Dr. Lynn Marie Morsky is president of the Psychedelic Medicine Association. She's host of the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast. I highly encourage that. And interim community manager for the American Psychedelic Practitioners Association. So she's my sister in arms. She sits on the advisory board of VETS, which is the veterans Exploring Treatment Solutions, as well as Psychedelics Today, Cybin, the Oxenberg Foundation, and the Ketamine Task Force. Dr. Morsky is a Mayo Clinic trained physician in family medicine, sports medicine, as well as an, an attorney and former adjunct law professor. Welcome all of our guests this evening. So glad to have everyone here. Thank you. All right, so let's dive into these questions. I think that the audience is just dying to know uh, more about psychedelics. And so um, I'm gonna open, open up our discussion um, with, um, first of all, let me do this. Let's do a quick poll 
to the to gauge the audience's knowledge about patch therapy, psychedelic therapy. Um, take the time, please take the time to look at that real quick. We, that'll give us a really good idea of, of, uh, of you know, the expertise in the, in, in the room. And while you're doing that, let me just roll into our first question. I want to start the question one is for Andrew. Andrew, could you explain to the audience what is psychedelics and exactly what is PATS? Yeah, absolutely. So psychedelic is it's it's a a fairly new word. It was it was in it was come up with in the 1950s, uh, and it it's a combination of the words. Uh, for mind and manifesting in in Greek, and so you know this is a group of drugs that a lot of us probably got trained as being called hallucinogens, which is really kind of misleading because uh, while they can cause some distortions in perception, it's uncommon that they actually cause frank hallucinations. And what they really do is they allow what more importantly they do, particularly in a therapeutic context, is they allow for people to have a internal experience of their own emotions, their own autobiography, and to feel connected to something larger than themselves. And so psychedelic assisted therapy is using these drugs in the context of psychotherapy as, as really a catalyst for psychotherapy. And so uh, this, is, this is not the same as you might be familiar with, say, prescribing something like Prozac, where you're writing a prescription, the person is taking it every day. In this model, the person is taking a drug only maybe once or twice um, in some models, or in the case of something like ketamine, maybe every few weeks in the context of a psychotherapeutic relationship. And prior to that drug administration session, there is non-drug preparation therapy. And afterwards, there's non-drug integration therapy. And the drugs that we're talking about are things such as psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in uh, psychedelic mushrooms, which is being uh, examined for major depression and alcohol use disorder, uh, MDMA, for the treatment of PTSD. Uh, LSD is being looked at for the treatment of generalized anxiety disorder. And then of course, as I mentioned, we've had ketamine for some time. And in more recent years, we've had S-ketamine, which is the S enantiomer of the ketamine molecule, uh, which has an FDA approval for depression. And racemic ketamine is, is being used for depression, but also things such as PTSD and OCD. So it encompasses a, a, a fairly wide range of, of different compounds uh, that, that generally fall into the category of psychedelic. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. This question is going to be directed to both Dr. Baden and, and, and yourself, Andrew. Why do PCPs need to know about this type of therapy? Um, is there any evidence to the, you know, to, which would support this, the use of this in, in primary care or other uh, potential areas of medicine. I think there's been some studies done in other areas looking at this, but uh, oncology, uh, and certainly uh, psychiatry and others. Um, so, uh, as well as um, the notion that primary care is the sort of the gatekeeper of, of mental health. So, could, could either of you explain or uh, help us understand the, the relationship between primary care and patch therapy, if there is any? Um, it's important for primary care providers to be aware of psychedelic assisted therapy because, like, as Dr. Smith had mentioned, primary care providers are at the front lines of mental health management and delivery. Um, the rapport that you are able to establish with the patient is rooted in trust and safety. And so as people are having treatment resistant complexities surrounding their mental health, or as people are researching these uh, modalities of treatment on their own, you're going to be a trusted source of information. You're going to be the person that's going to help with informed decision-making um, and also possibly be asked to determine medical and behavioral fitness for a psychedelic um, assisted therapeutic experience. Um, as these uh, therapies become more mainstream and have been uh, articles published in reputable journals like JAMA um, or in magazines like Time, um, they're going to become more mainstream and, and you're going to have more questions. So it's important to have some foundation um, so that way you can be empowered and educated to have these or to engage in these kind of discussions with your patients or colleagues. Yeah, um, Dr. Baden, I'd, I'd be curious if you would agree with this, that I, I often tell my students that our 
our patients are assessing us uh, more than we're actually assessing them. And one of the things they're assessing us is if it's safe to talk to us about certain things. And we tend to broadcast that by the language that we use. Uh, and and if that language is sort of up to up to current standards and if it's pejorative or not. So, you know, if a patient comes in and says, I, I read some about psychedelics and you say, you mean acid? <laughs> you know, you, you might seem a little out of date um, and, and maybe not up to speed on things. But if you said, oh, you know, uh, have you been, what have you been reading? You know, what have you heard? Um, it, it really uh, broadcasts to that, to that patient that you're somebody that they can consult with about this. So, so Andrew, I, I want to, or, or either, or, or either Dr. Baden or, or Dr. Morsky for that matter. Um, can you give us some evidence? Some, some of the, some of the studies that you've mentioned are, you know, I know Andrew, you've been involved in, in a few studies. Can you talk, can you speak to any of those or? Or provide our yeah. audience with some evidence. Sure. So there's really two front runners right now uh, for diff different drugs for different conditions, and so it gets a little murky sometimes when we talk about these in the same paragraph because it's easy to conflate the two. But the one that is really closest to FDA approval is MDMA, which, if you're not familiar with that abbreviation, that uh, as a street drug was known as ecstasy or Molly. Uh, this is methylene dioxy, methamphetamine. It's being used in a and in that context that I talked about of supporting psychotherapy for the treatment of PTSD. And there's already been one phase three paper published in Nature Medicine last year. And the second half of phase three has just wrapped up. Uh, that data is going to the FDA probably as we speak and uh, could potentially be looking at a, a new drug application approval as soon as the end of this year, the middle end of this year or early next year. Uh, psilocybin is a little further behind. So psilocybin has, there have been there were two uh, phase two studies, FDA registry trials for a major depression that have already, one has already been published in the New England Journal last uh, in, in December, I believe. And the one that I worked on uh, will be published hopefully in the next few months. Uh, so that's for major depression. There are other sponsors that are looking at that for the treatment of alcohol use disorder. And there's also a lot of, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but there's a lot of interest in palliative care uh, around particularly psilocybin as a means of, of uh, facilitating uh, more uh, closure, if you will, or emotional resolution for people that are facing life-threatening illnesses. This is one of the, the very early investigations of this, this drug is could it help people with anxiety uh, regarding a, a life-threatening uh, diagnosis, usually cancer. Uh, there were some important studies that were published in uh, 2016 from Johns Hopkins and NYU about uh, looking at that particular area of, of therapy. So there's a lot happening in the space, but really the one that you're probably going to hear about first coming out of the FDA would be MDMA for PTSD. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, expanded uh, information. We certainly need to know that. Um, my next question is for Dr. Morsky. Um, and this question is uh, directed at, uh, you know, uh, what role might, you know, primary care practitioners play in, 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 in doing patchwork in, in their practices? Is it a possibility? Um, what are your thoughts on that? So primary care providers have a number of roles they can play from the most basic, which is just knowing when a psychedelic assisted therapy is a good option for a patient. And then knowing enough to educate the patient about it and then perhaps make a referral. That's kind of the lowest level. I'd say, you know, just having that base level of knowledge. And then we really have a wide range of options. Primary care physicians as our primary care practitioners, as a lot of people on the call probably know, write 80% of antidepressant prescriptions. And therefore a whole lot of mental health is showing up on our door of mental health concerns. And so if maybe you're at a place where you're like, man, I really do enjoy trying to treat depression, but a lot of patients aren't getting better, perhaps you'd like to get more hands-on and you'd like to learn how to do maybe ketamine-assisted psychotherapy or when MDMA-assisted psychotherapy is, is available, you might want to learn to do that as well. So you have the option to refer to somebody else as just like you would refer to a surgeon. We, I often think that the paradigm of psychedelic medicine is kind of like the surgical paradigm, but it's like psycho-spiritual surgery because think about if you have a patient that's got prostate cancer, 
you're the one who's going to diagnose that, oh, there's something here that a person with higher level of knowledge needs. So you're going to refer to a psychedelic therapist like you would refer to a surgeon. But another part that may fall back on you as the primary care provider might be that clearance piece. Because right now, if you're going to send somebody to surgery, they send the person to anesthesia generally to do the clearance. Is their heart in good enough shape for this cardiovascularly? Can they handle it? Do they have any medications that might be contraindicated with the psychedelic that you were considering having them take? But we're not quite sure where that's going to fall. But that may also be something that as a primary care provider, you want to take care of for your patients is doing that clearance or that risk assessment. Um, so then, you know, we've got everything from referring doing the medicine yourself, doing the clearance. Uh, if you really want to get hands-on, you could perhaps get trained in, in integration or preparation, any of the kind of ends of the spectrum. Just if you can think about it kind of like that surgery paradigm, it's the same where the primary care is the first person they're going to, to, to talk about that complaint. You can refer to a specialist, but just like with therapy, with um, surgery, you probably have some preparation beforehand and you probably have some physical therapy after the surgery if it's like an orthopedic thing. Same thing with psychedelics. There's preparation beforehand. There's a lot of integration and therapy afterward for an, op for an optimal experience. And so really the primary care providers get to decide how much or how little they want to be involved in that process. So it's really flexible and, and it's a great opportunity for primary care providers who may be wanting to get more into, you know, new ways of helping your patient, or maybe, you know, as, as PCPs very often, we're given 15, 20 minutes with our patients. Well, psychedelic therapy, you can have between an hour and eight hours with your patients. So if you're looking for more time with your patient, you know, perhaps get, getting trained and doing that is another option for you. So follow-up question for, for you, Dr. Morski, as well as um, my other guests, can you discuss what, what's the actual practicality of rolling out something like this Within a primary care, and then what are some of some of the typical you know typical uh, you know questions that patients might answer, or, or excuse me, might ask you about this form of therapy? But I'd say let's just look at ketamine because right now ketamine is what we have available, and so I can imagine you know if I were practicing as a primary care doctor, patient comes to me. Uh, they might have tried a couple of antidepressants. It's not working. I educate them on, look, there's this other option, great for treatment resistant depression. It's called ketamine. And so like you would with, if you were sending them for, um, you know, transcranial stimulation or what any of the other like um, psych psychiatric therapies that are not just talk therapy, you might want to educate them a little bit on the therapy, but then you say, we're going to refer you to a quality provider they, you know, they've got you in your hands, but there will probably have to be, and hopefully will be some cross communication between that primary care provider and let's say the ketamine clinic to which they are sent. And then hopefully it, in, in concert with this, there is either that person you're sending them to is a ketamine assisted psychotherapist who's going to do preparation, the actual session and integration, or let's get their other therapist involved. This really is a collaborative effort. Like a lot of things, you know, PCPs are kind of playing quarterback, same thing here. Like Let's, you know, you're kind of the, the one person who's, you're looking at their medical history, you're looking at their medicines, you might, it's great if, and, and the Psychedelic Medicine Association is going, is putting out things to help you learn this, um, somebody already asked a question about it, but to learn how to say, oh, you're on this medicine, we can't send you for this other thing without tape, bring it off, you know, you're with that quarterback, but um, I think that's what it's going to look like, is just kind of like it, it is with other specialties, unless, of course, that primary care d d um, provider decides to start doing the therapy themselves, then it's a whole new paradigm. I want to talk about that too, actually. Um, so, so the the uh, you know, so the next uh, my next question for you would, would be this for my guest would be this. Uh, uh, maybe Dr. Bader, you can you can uh, tackle this, or or anyone can I can hop in. But Oregon and Cal and Colorado, you know, we they they're creating new frameworks for legal legalization there uh, at the state level for facilitated psilocybin sessions. Um, you know, with several other states considering similar policies. So, um, you know, this is this is a question that I, I, I'm not sure if if, um, if any, anyone knows about what's happening in, in especially in Oregon. Um, you know, what what will you know facilitated psilocybin sessions look like in Oregon? I mean, they uh, have a very different model, and theirs is one that doesn't necessarily follow the. Um, the medical model in the sense that we know it to be, but they still, uh, if they're following evidence, but they don't, you don't have, you don't have to go to a primary care physician or anybody or physician for that matter to get care there. So is there any, um, you know, 
what are the potentials of what that might look like in Oregon. If you bypass medicine and go right into, you know, uh, facilitated services. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I've got some say, some thoughts on that myself, but uh, what are your thoughts on, on any of that? Uh, Andrew, maybe, uh, you know, sure, Dr. Sure. Morsky. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Initiative 109 in Oregon uh, created a, a structure for uh, psilocybin service centers, I believe is the terminology they're using, which is a place where somebody can go and have a facilitated psilocybin experience. They don't necessarily have to be going for a medical indication, which is one of the departures from what we've been talking about up till now, which is really looking at these psychedelic assisted therapies as treatments for medical conditions such as depression or PTSD. So in Oregon, if you're just curious, you could go and do this in a in a in one of these centers where there would be some oversight and you would have some uh, degree of facilitation, but it's not going to be a psychotherapy model. That's first first and foremost important to understand. Um, in Oregon, from what it from what I can tell from sort of the outside looking in, they're really trying to strike a balance between access and safety. And of course, if you make it widely available, um, that's great from a access and equity standpoint. It it poses some potential risks in terms of, of safety. And so, for example, in the studies we've done in my lab, if somebody has a personal or family history of psychosis, uh, so say their mother, father, brother, sister has schizophrenia, we, we won't enroll them in our studies because we don't know if that can be done safely. If somebody has a history of cardiovascular disease or uncontrolled hypertension, uh, we don't admit them into the studies because uh, psilocybin, also MDMA, they are they do cause transient uh, hypertension and tachycardia. So we need to be able to be confident that somebody's heart can handle that. From what I've seen in the Oregon rules that are emerging, because it only just went into effect uh, January 1st, is that there, there isn't quite the level of um, detail that I've seen in those so far. Um, but what I've seen is that the facilitator should ask if the uh, if the per participant, because not a patient, has is on any medication, but the, the the thing that I'm a little concerned about is that those facilitators, because they have only had a certain amount of training, may, and it's not a medical background, may not have the knowledge to actually make that uh, determination as to who can be given this safely or not. And so, if I was a primary care provider in Oregon and I had patients who were asking about this. I would want to have a list of ideas in my mind of who would I be most concerned about. So if say somebody had uncontrolled hypertension or recently had an MI or had a history of hemorrhagic stroke, I would be very concerned about that person uh, undergoing psilocybin treatment or somebody who has um, a history of psychosis. Uh, I'd be concerned about that. And so it may be incumbent on primary care providers to be able to say, hey, you know, actually that might not be a good idea for you and here's why. If I could jump yeah, in here. I think, oh, Go yeah, ahead. please, please. No, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Andrew just teed me up beautifully. So thank you. Uh, yeah, that's the course I was talking about that we created was like uh, psilocybin risk management and assessment for primary care providers, because we do have an entire state of providers that may be caught unaware when a patient walks in and they say, I'm on lithium and I have this, this history of an MI two years ago. Can I do this? And there, you know, there isn't a guidebook period. And so what we tried to do was, take the guidelines from, as, as Andrew said, you know, studies, which have to be very conservative. So studies will mm -hmm. keep out more people than you would need to keep out on a just medical safety basis so that they can have more um, homogenous populations to study. But we've, you know, we've taken a look at, you know, renal clearance and hepatic clearance and all those things and tried to set out some guidelines. Again, we can't even call it a clearance because there isn't enough information to call it a clearance at this point. However, we're calling it like risk stratification, but that that's absolutely crucial that Oregon providers start to, you know, uh, increase their knowledge on this type of clearance because those patients are going to come asking. And I think, uh, you know, Andrew brings up a good point is that if you are a, a physician in Oregon or a primary care provider of any type in Oregon, I wouldn't even wait till your patients ask because they may just go without you even being consulted. I would heads up, just start saying to any patient, uh, just so you know, there's this, uh, if you've heard about this psilocybin program in Oregon, if you're thinking of doing it, 
please let me know first, just so we can go over your medicines, because that at least gets them in their head, like that you're an open door to come to, like mm -hmm. you said, you know, you're safe to come to. And also so that they don't like completely forget that, oh, it may be important to, to check that my, you know, uh, cardiac history is okay to do this psilocybin. So yeah, I think it would be a great idea if, if those in Oregon proactively said, if you're going to go do this, let us know. And yeah. then of course the impetus is on those same providers to have the knowledge. You know, that's actually a great public health measure to actually consider in Oregon. Um, I've actually, I work, I actually work in Oregon with the Alma Institute. And so one of the, some of the stuff that, that Andrew, you brought up regarding the sort of the qualifications of individuals, you don't have to have a, um, any training to be a facilitator in Oregon. You have to be 21 years old and have a background check. So that passes. So those are the only qualifi qualifications that you need. So I've been reviewing, you know, several, uh, uh, you know, um, applications for individuals who want to be facilitators in Oregon. We're getting a, a, an array of individuals, but most of them, a, a lot of them have training, uh, additional yeah. training as, as uh, you know, healers in other spaces, or they've held space for, for uh, uh, you know, individuals in, in, in you know, there's two, there's two kinds of, um, uh, you know, um, psilocybin or, or psychedelic sessions. There's above ground and below ground. So some, some folks have uh, what's called below ground work where they, they're out, they're not in, in the public doing this because the only thing that's legal that Dr. Morsky said is ketamine. So, um, so, so, you know, but some people are still doing this regardless of that. So we want to make sure that when people are doing it, they're doing, doing it the right way. Um, Andrew, do you have something that you want to add something? Oh, I was also just going to add in around drug, drug interactions as well. So, mm. um, well, the, 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 drug drug interactions are relatively uh, manageable with this there are certain things that are fairly common particularly in primary care such as trazodone for insomnia that will uh, drastically reduce the effects of something like psilocybin because psilocybin is a serotonin 2a agonist and trazodone and mirtazapine are serotonin 2a antagonists as are all the atypical antipsychotics uh, which many people are on for depression augmentation. So in our studies, we taper people off the majority of medications before they go into this. Also with say MDMA, uh, that is uh, significantly attenuated by SSRIs. Um, and so when people are taking those, they often don't get as much of an effect. So it'll be important to know what are these uh, these considerations that, that need to be undertaken. Um, it, it appears that when people are on SSRIs for a longer uh, period of time that it does attenuate the effect of the antidepressant effects of, of psilocybin as well. So, so these are things that are going to be um, that that people may be coming to you and saying, you know, I think I'm going to try uh, this. I want to I want to go to one of these uh, service centers. Um, should I stop my uh, Should I stop my Lexapro? Um, or if I have stopped it, when can I go back on it? So these are going to be the kind of things that, that we're going to want to have some, to be able to be conversant in. So I, I do know that the Oregon law, uh, Measure 109, they're continually updating, uh, you know, and they're learning new things about, about, about uh, uh, the, the initial rollout in January, for January 1st. So I think that the next time they'll, they'll meet together as a body to vote on new rules uh, of engagement there, will be in the fall of 2024. So we got some room to work to improve the law. So, but I do know other the nations watching Oregon um, with this facilitated program that they have out. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, Dr. Morsky's notion about, uh, you know, this, uh, this idea of safety and this idea of making sure patients understand this would be a great public service message to actually to put forward in Oregon to make sure that you can minimize any kind of potential uh, you know, harm that, that might be done to patients by people who are just inexperienced. So part of our um, initiative there at, at the Alma Institute is to make sure that we have people on staff to help uh, with sort of help to mitigate some of the, the potential problems that might develop when people are taking these medications. So, I, I, you know, for me, I, a question I have for you as, as a as guest is in primary care. Some primary care practitioners might want to do this work, right? It would mean that changing the way that you practice or at least seeing patients uh, you know who, who want to undergo this this sort of therapeutic uh, modality you know I'm, I'm often I'm wondering um, and, you know Andrew you might have some, some remarks on this would another psychedelic make sense if it were of course proved and all that but you know 5 meo you know a shorter half-life um, you know patients can be in and out and you know in two hours three hours uh, rather than eight six hours 
uh, you know, so is that poten a potential option? I'm just throwing it out there, you know. Uh, I suspect it's it's going to stay within the realm of a specialty. I I, I mean, Dr. Baden will be able to uh, speak to this more uh, more thoroughly than I can, since she's actually in primary care. Um, you, you know, really, one of the wonderful things about this kind of therapy is that it's it's very rich in terms of the time that you spend with with patients, um, which is exactly the problem that primary care has. That they don't get enough time with patients, so. Um, you know, if you're seeing people in seven minute, 15 minute blocks, um, you know, you can barely get uh, health maintenance done, let alone do treatment. Um, Dr. Baden, do you want to pick that one up? I, I think you could speak to it better than I can. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Um, this is going to take a, an atypical primary care practice if you want to facilitate this kind of therapy or medicine, because um, just as Andrew alluded to, there isn't enough time. And then also, how are you as a primary care practitioner going to be reimbursed for this service? Um, and, and again, do, does the patient need to have somebody take him or her home after the session? And so those are going to be logistics um, that are going to, um, to be studied um, if you're going to do this in a typical primary care practice. So I think as Dr. Morsky alluded to, it might have to be like a surgical setup where you have your procedure day. And that way you can account for um, these longer sessions. And again, depending on what state you're in, this might not be a legal option for you. And so right now you may only have access to ketamine or spravato and you're going to have to allot some time for that. So those are the only things that are legal right now or insurance approved and can be reimbursed. It may have some um, cost efficacy for your patients at this time. So, I, so, so, help me understand this this uh, this, this idea. So, if, if a primary care provider um, wants to assist uh, their patients who wish to pursue this, um, how would they go about doing that? Is there a way? Is there any training for them, or any any special ideas around that they ought yes. to know about? There are so many different um, options, but I'd like to plug uh, Dr. Morsky's group, um, the Psychedelic Medicine Association. If you're not a part of it, please join. She didn't even pay me to say that. Um, <laughs> but it is such a um, wealth of information with evidence-based classes that you can take on your own time. They have live courses or courses that are recorded and you can do them virtually. And the um, educational piece, that group is called Fluence, if I'm not mistaken. And there's so many, um, reputable providers who are providing this education, uh, PhDs, MDs, all sorts of uh, credentials. And um, it's been a wealth of information. So thank you, Dr. Morsky, if you want to speak to that some more. <laughs> I totally did not pay her to say that, but just so grateful. <laughs> um, and we have, you know, and so the Psychedelic Medicine Association, yes, our entire mission was to educate primary pr care providers up to the point that they could at least do the referral. But a whole lot of our uh, members want to go further because this is something, a way to get more, I don't know, uh, more than that 15 minute appointment that I think so many people just don't feel the connection, mm -hmm. right? And so Fluence is a great option. They have a number of training um, centers, but there are other ones that uh, include like, I think Andrew could speak to one of these too, there's um, Integrative Psychiatry Institute, which is called IT, IP, IPI, IPI, one. yeah, yeah, Prati, they're just like um, CIIS, MAPS has a training. And so it really depends on the medicine that you want to administer. Some of these programs are kind of trans medicine programs. And then some of these are like, here's ketamine assisted psychotherapy program. Here's an MDMA assisted psychotherapy program. And so I think kind of the benefit of coming into the association is that you can come in and you can discuss like who's taken what program this in our Facebook group. We also, we also see this, like, what did you get out of this program? How did it prepare you for this and that? And so that's, that's a, a great, you know, resource to come in and chit chat. But Andrew, I'd love to hear your thoughts to round it out. Yeah, I, I would also encourage that, you know, while I know a lot of psychiatry happens in primary care, and certainly a lot of counseling happens in primary care, um, there is a, a level of, of, of uh, training in psychotherapy that I think is going to be really important, and particularly, you, you know, maybe with, with cases that are less complex, um, there'll be less of a need for the psychotherapy training, but, but you can get into some pretty deep material here. And in order to do that, having competencies in psychotherapy is also important. So 
you know, one of the things that gets a lot of press in this space is the drugs themselves. And, you know, if you're, if you're on this call, it's probably because somewhere along the line, you saw some New York times headline that says, you know, party drug drug treats veterans trauma, um, you know, or some words to that effect. And, and, and while that there's an element of truth in that, what really was treating those, those veterans trauma was psychotherapy. And it was accelerated and deepened by the use of something like MDMA, but there's a lot of psychotherapy that happens in this. And so, you know, we love the quick fix narrative. We love the, you know, one and done, take a pill and this is behind you. I think it's a lot more complicated than that. And the other thing that you're going to see in your primary care patients that we haven't really encountered yet is, is that people are going to do this and then the effects are going to wane after a while, you know, and there's, there's in the early days of this, there was, there were these sort of almost miracle narratives where, you know, somebody had this treatment and they never had depression again. And it would be great if that were the case for everyone. But I suspect what's going to be more likely is that this is going to move our treatment models in psychiatry towards episodic treatment. I mean, we're seeing this with non-psychedelic medicines too, you know, so um, there's a new drug on the market which is dextromethorphan with bupropion, which is taken for two weeks. Um, there's some other, some new, um, GABA A agonists that are coming out this year that are taken for a couple of weeks and then stopped. So it's a different mo- non psychedelics. They don't, they don't have any psychedelic effects, but the idea of, of, of treating depression, like we might treat an infection. So, you know, here's a course of treatment that you take for two weeks and then you stop. And if it comes back, we treat it again, but we're not necessarily going to have you keep taking this drug indefinitely. Um, because the depression might come back, which is our current model of treatment. So thank you. Thank you, Andrew, um, and for, for that last uh, explanation. Dr. Bailey, her question, and, this is, and I, you know, I hate to put people of color on the spot, man, because you know, we feel like a handful of us in this space, but I'm gonna put you on the spot. Um, what does access look like? With, with PATS therapy? I mean, is this open for everybody? I would assume that it is. is are there anything that might prevent, barring the legal aspects, uh, that might prevent us from having full access for people of color, um, you know, gender identity folks and, and, and others who have been marginalized and oppressed? Is there a place for them within this whole new profession? Um, you They're bring up a, a very good question and a very good point. Um, Looking at this space, the trials, the participants, the people conducting the trials, funding the trials are pretty homogeneous. You know, I would say the majority are, you know, white, cis, heterosexual males participating or running trials. Um, So there's not enough gender equity or representation in the BIPOC community um, and also gender diversity. So yes, there is space for this. Um, We have to pay homage and Um, and remind people that these medicines have been around for thousands of years and were traditionally practiced in indigenous cultures. And for whatever reason, people of color have been disproportionately criminalized and therefore not given access to um, mind manifesting medications. You know, it's, there's also fear in the BIPOC community of engaging in some of these practices because of fear of uh, criminalization or other um, negative impact. So I think it's important that we come from a narrative of not just a DEI perspective of, you know, hey, Darren and I are on the call, so we are providing access and inclusion, but what is the overall stance of providing an an anti-racist approach to um, the psychedelic space? What are we doing about people who are complicit about not engaging the people who are most vulnerable or marginalized? And why are we not reaching out to include people in these studies? Because we're not very much represented. And I don't know how many um, people in the BIPOC community would feel a sense of trust to even inquire about this with their provider who may not look like them or have a shared experience. So that's another concern. So I know MAPS has tried to train more um, therapists of color to facilitate some of these studies or even to facilitate um, training when and if uh, these medications are FDA approved and cleared and legal, Um, but we need to go beyond that. 
We yeah. need to go beyond the just the, the face of diversity but, and inclusion, but actually, you know, having more concrete solutions. Andrew, you want to chime in? Yeah, um, you know, th this is you bring up such important topics, Dr. Baden, about about access and and you know, there's a lot of if people are on the call who are are deep in the psychedelic space are, are familiar with these discussions, but around access and around the cost of these things and 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 the utility and wisdom of bringing this into a medical model and the costs that might go along with that. But at the same time, also, how does that increase access? You know, so if right now, the only way you can get these things is uh, legally would be ketamine, most insurance plans will not cover ketamine because they consider it an off-label use of the drug. And so in most urban areas, you're looking at anywhere between $500 and $1,000 cash per dose, uh, per session, which might be, uh, you might need to do that every couple of three weeks. Most people don't have that kind of money. And so in order to make this accessible, we can do a couple of different things and they're, and they're not mutually exclusive. So the organ model is one that potentially has a, a community piece to it. Um, there could be group sessions uh, as such that would be make it more cost effective. Uh, and then you also bake in a, a, a sort of a web of community where people that have had this experience can talk about it afterwards and can lean on each other in much the same way a 12-step group might. Um, you know, 12-step groups don't cost anything. Um, and then the other thing which can happen in parallel and doesn't need to be, this is a both and, is medicalization. And that we make these treatments that are under Medicare formularies, for example, because if they're under Medicare formularies, then people who don't live on the coast that don't have access to psychedelic therapists and underground can get these from somebody who they would feel trusting of, maybe a psychiatrist or maybe their primary care provider, uh, because they don't have access to these psychedelic networks. Um, you know, I, the, my currently most radical idea is that we should have psychedelic clinics in Walmart. Um, because there are Walmarts in every town in America. Many of them already have medical clinics in them. You have an, you know, it's 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 a very anti elitist idea of having these available to um, the general public in a in a relative at scale, um, at a in a way that's cost effective, and so and that that doesn't have to preclude things like Oregon from happening. I think both can happen in tandem. You know, one of the things that you often get from psychedelic experiences is the world is a lot bigger than your ideas. <laughs> And, and I think that's the challenge I want to put out to our community and thinking about this because we get really stuck in this either or when I think what we really need is a both and. You know, in, in Oregon, we're, we're, actually, we're actually working very hard to, to make um, the facilitator workforce diverse and inclusive. We're working very yeah. hard to, to, to identify individuals there who, who show interest in working with communities of color. Uh, or who have experience above and before, or, or below um, ground to, to work with folks in a, in, a, in a safe and effective way. So one way that we can mitigate um, this is by, is by bringing more peak therapists into the space. And I think one of the things I want to, I want to mention just real quick, one, one of our colleagues, um, Joseph McGowan, is very robust and active in this space. He, in fact, uh, you know, he did a very, I mean, he was just, he was single, almost single-handedly brought, you know, this, the, the last, MAPS cohort that Andrew mentioned earlier that's, been, that's currently in publication now. I think, I think the, uh, that was the first, first um, study that had 52 or 53% of its, its participants were people of color. Because we really don't know much about, well, we have case studies from, from you know, small studies that have been done on people, you know, folks of color in the space. And from what I've read and what I've seen, it's pretty, it's pretty comparable. Um, so, but I do think it goes it goes differently if the, if the uh, facilitator is a person of color or the therapist is, is a person of color. So I think we have to do a better job at make, creating opportunities, scholarship opportunities at some of, our, some of the training facilities like what we're trying to do at, with the Alma Institute. We have to create opportunities to bring people into the space. Um, and then when we get them there, we have to act right so they'll stay uh, because often, you know, uh, there's, you know, they get scared, scared off. But in my experience working in this community, I find I have found, uh, and maybe this is I'm jaded. I'm an older cat. I'm jaded. People have been very, uh, very kind and very, um, you know, um, willing to work and, and and do things that are necessary uh, across the aisle 
uh, you know, the racial divide, the gender, you know, the gender identity divide. So I think there's good, good karma. And I'm really impressed with what MAPS, what MAPS did. MAPS had a disastrous rollout the first time they were trying to introduce um, and diversity inclusion, bring in more folks of color. They had, you know, lots of their staff were teaching it, didn't have any experience with communities of color. So it didn't go very well, but to their credit, they listened. Um, my, my colleague, uh, Monica Williams, I think all of you have no Monica Williams, uh, just basically called them out in an article and they, they were, rather than getting upset and frustrated, they actually responded to it. So Joseph is the product of, of all of that, those a few years of, of, of you know, sort of a, a rough, rough rollout for, for folks of color. So. Well done, MAPS. So we need more organizations doing that kind of work to sort of, to sort of make uh, you know, equity a reality as opposed to just a pipe dream. So with that being said, I think we might have time for questions. So um, let's, let's go to the first question and see, I think. Uh, so this is, uh, the first question is, is there a community, anyone can answer this, please feel free to answer this. Is there a community of primary care providers uh, uh, that are that that you recommend for psilocybin? My therapist has agreed to a uh, psilocybin session. Anybody that you would recommend that she could go to to get? I guess I, I'm assuming some pre some pre uh, pre certification before. Um, yeah, because I was going to ask what the question is because you cannot recommend psilocybin at this point. Right. Um, still federally illegal, unsure what it looks like in Oregon if they can, but at this point there aren't any centers open for them to send to at this point. And so if your therapist is agreeing to you going to it, they must mean in, let's say that they mean in the Netherlands or Mexico or somewhere where it's legal, we'll say that, yes. Um, but that's exactly what we were trying to say is that the, the PCPs may not recommend it, maybe your therapist recommended it, but great to go back to your PCP and ask with my medical history, with my family history, um, am I okay to take this? And like I said, our the Psychedelic Medicine Association, our course is going through the CME CE certification process. It will be out soon, hopefully as Oregon rolls out. But yeah, currently you, it, you would have to, you know, there, and once the people have taken our course, we will make a database. Anybody who's passed our course will have a database so that you're looking for a doctor who knows how to do a psil psilocybin risk mitigation and certification exam. Here's your database. Um, so, but at this point, you know, there isn't, there, there aren't really PCPs that are super trained on that, unfortunately, coming. Uh, I would listen to Dr. Morsky because she's also an attorney. And so this is not legal. I want to emphasize that this is not legal yet. Hopefully it will be, but it's not legal yet. I don't think it's legal right now. It's ketamine. So our next question uh, uh, by uh, Paula, do you know uh, what the label of 4-MDMA will look like once it eventually is Legal? We, we don't yet. I mean, that that's going to be part of the NDA process with the FDA. Uh, so that's to be determined. Um, you know, the the big question right now is really translation. You know, how do is the FDA going to require that we essentially recreate the circumstances in which we did these trials in? You know, that is often the case with straight up drug approvals is that they will approve it for the doses that were studied um, and, and not higher or not lower um, to recreate the same conditions in the studies will be very cost prohibitive. So in all these studies, we've had two therapists the entire time from beginning to end, same two therapists that are in the preparatory non-drug sessions that are also in the room all day with the, the patient and then are uh, coming back for the integration therapy sessions. So in the in the MAP study, it was about 48 hours of patient facing time uh, times two uh, therapists, right? So we're you know looking at almost 100 hours of of therapy time in there. And you know if you were to multiply that say by $200 an hour, you know you're looking at almost $20,000. Um, so it's it's unclear. There's a lot of things that are really up in the air right now. Um, with regards to the FDA. And one of the things that we really don't know yet is if the FDA is going to include in the label a requirement of who can deliver this therapy, uh, whether it will need to, whether the person will have need to go through a particular course of training, whether they'll have to have a particular professional credential, all of that is to is up in the air right now. And we don't really know. And so all these programs that are offering training 
it, you have to understand that they're all offering a kind of a speculative model because the FDA has not said this is what it will be required. You know, so when I went through nursing school and I went through NP school, it was very clear what courses I had to take in order to, to sit for my board exams and get my license. Um, such a clarity does not exist yet in the psychedelic space. So there's a lot of speculation that's happening right now in anticipation of that. Now, Oregon is an is a is a exception because Oregon has specifically said these are the requirements for training programs for somebody to be certified as a as a sitter in Oregon. And so a bunch of different programs have tailored their curriculum to meet those requirements. So that's an example of like where we have a clear outcome, we can then tailor the curriculum to fit that 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 requirement. So um, thank you and as well, um, Andrew, for that. Um, so question, the ne next question is uh, maybe the, whoever can, I don't care who answers these questions and any one of you are qualified to do so. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how to bring up psilocybin research or psychedelic research uh, to one's colleagues in the field? Ask them what their favorite Grateful Dead or Fish song is? No. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's so everywhere that I don't even think it's much of a challenge anymore. Do you, Lynn Marie? You look like you're about to say something. Oh, I mean, this is you know, this is what what we do, and and I'd say it's the combination of evidence based. So so much research is coming out, but then there are so many anecdotes that are extremely powerful. If you've heard anybody from that, you know, the veterans organization, um, or you know, vets that were like. Jonathan Lubecki, who tried to take his life multiple times, he was just in, I think they featured him also on that John Oliver yeah, clip, but he's been in, been in the Netflix thing, I think as well. But when you hear these stories and combine it with the astounding findings, like I think that, you know, anybody who is so mired in stigma that that combination doesn't do it for them, like, I don't really know what else you can say until they finally yeah. themselves have some family member, somebody who's at the end and then, you know, they, they, they finally try it, you know, so that's the, but that it's the combination of, for me, evidence-based plus some, some really powerful anecdotes that seems to work. Yeah. If anything, it's the opposite problem that of say 10 years ago, when I was talking about this uh, initially was I would encounter a lot of skepticism, which I think is sort of the subtext of the question. And now I'm actually finding myself in the role of being like, whoa, okay, hold on. Let's manage expectations here because there's been so much hype in this space about it. And this is going to be some kind of panacea. And I get it. You know, I mean, depression is awful. PTSD is awful. Our treatments aren't all that effective. And so the desperation for something better is totally understandable. My fear is that we're going to overhype this and then it's going to under deliver and it's going to be yet another disappointment in a string of disappointments. You know, we, those of us who are old enough to remember when SSRIs rolled out, they were going to cure depression. That didn't work out so well. You know, I'm glad that we have them and I'm not here to poop on SSRIs, but I'm here to say, you know, like we need better treatments, but it didn't cure depression. And I don't think psychedelics are going to cure the world of mental health problems either. They're going to be a very important tool but they're not going to cure it. So here's uh, here's the final question of the evening, I believe, we're just up to that moment. What kinds of public policy can be implemented to support education for clinicians and states where these services come online? Erica, you unmuted there. Do you want to take a stab at that one? <laughs> um. As primary care providers, I think we have the opportunity to lobby um, if you want to get to know some of your legislators. Um, also, if you are part of an academic institution, um, allowing for conferences that have this subject matter in, in um, as part of educational pieces. So I think those are things that you can try to do um, to advocate uh, new treatments for your patients, um, to advocate maybe compassionate use, um, and also to bring awareness in, in your, with your colleagues. But um, yeah, don't forget that you have some, you have a voice, you have a legislative um, representative that um, will be associated with your medical body, whether it's the um, AMA or your uh, AFP or whatever medical body that you um, are joining, utilize them. Okay, hey, um, I think that's our final remark for, for the evening. I want to thank our guest again for, for taking the time uh, to show up this evening and to answer questions. And I'm going to turn the time back over to, to Jazz. Thank you so much, everyone. 
Um, I realized that I forgot to introduce myself up front. So in case you're wondering who this talking head is, my name is Jazz Glastra and I'm the Director of Program Operations at Brain Futures. So I just wanna um, give a huge thank you to Dr. Smith for not only moderating, but for putting together the idea for this panel in the first place. Um, thank you, Dr. Baden, Andrew, and Dr. Morsky for sharing your expertise. Um, and we appreciate all of you, the participants um, coming tonight, and we will make the recording available to you very soon. It will also be on our website with our papers and our other resources on psychedelic assisted therapy. So please visit us at brainfutures.org and um, perhaps my colleague Bridget can drop that link in the chat. Um, other panelists, if you have links you would like to share with folks, you can drop it in the chat now and we will also include those in a, in a follow-up email. Um, so finally, just thank you all for attending and for spending your time with us tonight. And we hope you have a wonderful evening. Good night.